uh, some of the results from the project that we're doing for our Hickory project this year, characterizing green algal biodiversity of Hawaiian reef and estuarine communities. And this is an update from where we are at the current time of doing this project. And the PI on this grant and my co-PI is Dr. Gannot Preston, who works in the Molecular Biosciences and Bioengineering Department at UH, and Tarish and Sekrans are doing a lot of the laboratory work that we acknowledge here. So why are we doing this project in the first place? We think it's really important to get a good handle on the genetic diversity of the seaweeds that we have here in the Hawaiian Islands. And there are projects that are occurring worldwide right now that are discovering huge numbers of species that are sometimes hidden behind very simple morphologies. And one of our aims is to try to characterize the taxa that we're able to recognize right now based on morphology using some of these genetic techniques. And see if these morphological species are really matching up using these two different sets of techniques. Why are we focusing on green algae for this particular project? We have a number of ongoing projects right now for all the major algal groups in Hawaii, including uh, the red algae, the green algae, the brown algae, and even now we're branching into diatoms as well. And this is a project that complements very well some of the other efforts that we have going on. So it's a way that we can expand upon the tools that we're developing in a broader sense for all of the algae that we have here in Hawaii, and try to hone them and focus them a little bit more so that they work as well for the green algae. What are we aiming to provide? We're characterizing all the green algae of Hawaii the best that we can. This is what we're calling a DNA sequence diversity assessment. And a lot of you might have heard of the DNA barcoding initiative. This is something that began in 2003. The idea there is that we can use short regions of the genome, a, a short piece of DNA from each organism, to have a species-specific tag, to be able to determine what species it is. And we're building on that initiative, and we're using uh, one marker to do this, but we're also adding in markers from other genomes within these algae to have a backup plan, essentially, to have several different independent data sets to be able to compare to each other. The aims and the scope of the project then are to try to characterize all of the green algal species in marine and estuarine habitats that we have here in the Hawaiian Islands using these genetic techniques. And we'll be talking a little bit more at the end about where we are, where we're headed with this research. Okay, what do we know to date about the green algal flora of Hawaii? Well, this is our foremost compendium of green algae in Hawaii right now. It's by Abbott and Boosman in 2004. It was published. And in that book, they estimated about 110 green algal species that are known from marine and brackish water habitats around the Hawaiian Islands. And that's a decent-sized flora. And there's a lot of different species to go out and find. Some of these, maybe 50, 60 of them, are relatively conspicuous, large, and somewhat easy to find. But there are lots more that are very difficult to find. So that's where our real challenge lies in trying to find these more cryptic, difficult taxa to include these in our characterizations. Now, traditionally, people have been using morphological identification to come up with species names for all algae, not just green algae. Lots of reasons for that, uh, but it's still an extremely valuable technique that all phycologists use to some degree. But there are some drawbacks to it. One is that it requires a lot of time and taxonomic expertise. I think that's the people who were here in my phycology class last semester, and you can attest to this. It takes a lot of work, doesn't it, to, to identify these species. It takes a lot of expertise um, and a lot of time. Not everyone has that kind of time who needs to know what algal species are. Secondly, sometimes it requires characters that are absent for much of the year, and there's not much anyone can do about it. You can be the world's foremost expert in a group, and if your specimen doesn't have the features that you need, it's going to be impossible to put a name on it. So here's where molecular characterization helps us to overcome this. It can help with identification of algae if a suitable DNA sequence framework is established. So if we're able to sequence a piece of DNA from a specimen that we can't necessarily identify morphologically, if we have a reference framework of sequences built already, we can use it to compare to those sequences that we've already archived and perhaps have a match or a close match to something that's already been identified in the framework. This relies on the DNA contained in the organism rather than the morphology. So in that sense, it allows us to circumvent some of the problems that we have with morphological identification. This is a project that complements our ongoing efforts to characterize the red and the brown algal floras in the state of Hawaii. And there are lots of potential uses for a system like this. And this is, once we get beyond this year, which is really setting the backbone of this project, populating our framework, there are a lot of uses we would like to put this to. There are lots of different tools we would like to be involved in developing that will be of great importance for resource managers. 
In the simplest case scenario, it might allow for identification of new species or records that have just been not easily seen before in the flora. Things that we're able to pick up in terms of DNA sequence diversity that you just can't see in a very simple morphology. It might allow for the rapid detection of invasive species or strains entering the state. And an example would be something like Colerpa taxifolia. And this is an alga which is famous because it's caused a lot of problems in certain parts of the world. It's not a whole species that is problematic, however. It's a strain of the species that is extremely invasive. And one of the ways that we might be able to detect these is through these genetic methods. It also allows for determination of floristic composition of a region or a sampling area. It's possible that we'd be able to have larger numbers of these samples collected from a single point. We might be able to uh, get to the point of sampling communities rather than individuals and getting a biodiversity assessment of that area using these sorts of techniques. Okay, now what I'll be talking about today is where we are today in this project. And I'm going to be outlining some of the changes that we've made as we've moved through this year. Um, and that's because most research projects tend to evolve a little bit as you move through. So I'd like to uh, at least clarify what we originally said and what we're doing now. Originally, we had proposed to use a region of the 23S rRNA plasma gene. Um, and we have kept this, and I'm going to qualify it a little bit. This is a region that was identified by Michael P.I., Gernot Presting, in 2006, using a bioinformatic assessment of all plastid genomes. This is a region of the plastid genome which universally amplifies, meaning everything that has a plastid plus cyanobacteria are able to yield this gene in a very simple technique. We also proposed to use a mitochondrial marker. Originally, we said the mitochondrial CO1 gene. You might recognize this. Uh, from the previous talk that we just heard by Chris Burton. This is a region that has been proposed by the Barcode of Life Initiative as the DNA barcode for most organisms. Not all, but most. Now, in our modified proposal, we are still using this 23S rRNA plastic region, uh, but we've had to modify the primers that we're using a little bit for the green algae. Up here I said it's universally amplifying, and in fact it is for the most part, but we're getting better amplification success for the green algae with a slightly modified set of primers. Okay, so we had to tinker with that a little bit to get our success rates increased for this particular region. In terms of the mitochondrial CO1 region, well, it turns out that this region is simply not going to be viable for the green algae and for the land plants. It's not just my lab that's determined this, but there's an entire land plant barcode initiative that's also um, determined that this is not going to be working. It contains a lot of introns in this particular region for green algae, which makes it very difficult to work with in this sort of technique. It's certainly not a rapid assessment um, at that level. So we needed to come up with a different second marker to use for this assessment, um, and we have honed in on the nuclear ITS region. This is a region that has been used very commonly for species-level studies within the green algae in the past. There's already a, a large database of sequences available for comparison. This is going back to the very beginning. This is the framework that we established originally to test out these primers for the plastid marker. And this tree that I'm showing you here on the left-hand side of the slide is just to show you that indeed we were able to amplify and sequence from a whole variety of different things, including green algae, eugalians, green, uh, red algae, diatoms, amplified brown algae. So this is one region that seems to work very well across a whole series of different in this preliminary framework, we had 107 different sequences, including 19 green algae. Um, and I forgot to mention that the cyanobacteria are also included in this framework. 